So we call this slope right here, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Now what is y2 is take x2 and f it. That's how you get the second y value. How to get your first y value? Almost the same exact way. y1 equals take x1 and f it. So there we go, y1 and y2, f of x1 and f of x2. So all we're doing is talking about slope. And the only difference is I just use b and a for x2 and x1. They're exactly the same thing. So nothing crazy is happening here. That's average velocity or rate of change. So this is the rate of change of f when x goes between a and b. So we're going to use this rate of change. The only difference is on our computations down here, all I did was I replaced a by t and b by t plus h. So we got a comma b right here. So a is t, b is t plus h. So all I did for average velocity, this is just same exact formula. I just have B and A is T plus H and T. So nothing tricky is going on. The only thing I did is I just <coughs> did T minus T is zero. Canceled them out. That's the only thing I did right here. That's it. And we call this our difference quotient. So that's from pre-calculus one. We did difference question a little bit. We're going to do it a whole lot in calculus class. Difference question is going to come up again and again. All right, so that's our average velocity from t to t plus h. We got that formula right there. So let's find, we're going to go back to our original example, f of t equals 16t squared. So same function as before. So I want to find the average velocity on the interval t comma t plus h. <clears throat> so we got a is t, a is t, b is t plus h. So t minus t cancels out. We just get a divided by h. Now, I'm going to plug in t plus h into f. So take t plus h and f it plus h. So what is that? 16 t plus h, whole thing squared. So what I just wrote in red is the most common wrong answer for f of t plus h. So what, this is definitely not f of t plus h. What is this thing that I just wrote down over here? It is something. f of t plus h, I need to actually FOIL the t plus h. I need to square that properly, not just square to the first term and forget about the second. So it's pronounced the exact same way, but written like this. So what I just wrote down is f of t and then add a h at the very end. So this is not taking f plus, or uh, t plus h and then f'ing that. This is 
f of t and then just adding h at the end. So very different. So don't do any of this over here. This is all, all wrong. So don't do that. So graphically, we'll just be moving it down the timeline? You'll be moving it, yeah, up h or down h, depending if it's positive or negative, yeah. Whereas if you graphed f of t plus h, that would be a shift horizontally. Right. Very different than a vertical shift. All right, foil this out. So 16 t plus h squared is 16 t squared plus 32 th plus 16 h squared. All right, so that should be foiled out. So all that I wrote is just f of t plus h minus f of t. So it's that whole thing minus f of t. All right, what cancels out? Easy algebra. 16t squared, 16t squared. So that cancels out. So what do we have? 32th plus 16h squared divided by h. Can I cancel my h's? I can if I'm super careful, but what should I do first, especially if I'm a new uh, calculus student? Factor. So we're going to factor it out. So in the numerator, we're going to write h times 32t plus 16h. Now I can cancel. No problem. h cancels the other h. And we have 32t plus Sixteen h, and of course, what is this? This is the average velocity from t to t plus h. So that's what we were just computing and simplifying. All right, way easier than this stuff we had going on before. We had to start squaring stuff and all that. This is going to be a way nicer formula for us to work with. We're going to put some, plug some numbers in. <clears throat> so on the lecture yesterday, I wanted to find the instantaneous speed at t equals 1. That was our goal. We were finding different averages as our interval got smaller and smaller and smaller. But if it gets too small, we're going to have to spend a lot of time computing out by hand all these numbers. So what we just did is make that computation way faster. We can plug numbers very easily into this formula here. We can handle that. So I'm going to rewrite the find instantaneous velocity. Instant A N E O U S. All right, at t equals one. Well, that's the t part right there. So that's easy. We know what t is. So we're going to do instead. So we're going to find v bar, the average velocity, on the interval 1 comma 1 plus h. And all I'm going to do is make h smaller and smaller and smaller. And then hopefully we'll see a pattern and it will be very easy to determine what we would go towards if h got very, very, very small. So we're going to find v bar, or average velocity, on 1 comma 1 plus h. So all I did was I used t, t plus h right here, t, t plus h, and just plugged in 1 for t. So nothing magic's going on there. Average velocity is 32 times 1 plus 16h. So all we're going to do is write down some h values, and then what velocity that would correspond to. So let's start h with, we'll start it way up at one second. So we get 32 plus 16h. All right, what do we get when h is 1? 
48, which I think is what we got. If you watched the video yesterday, that's what we got. We computed it yesterday. So we better get the same thing or else something is messed up. So we got 48, no problem. We also, I think we did 0.1 as well. So that's 32 plus 16 times 0.1, which is 32 plus 1.6, 33.6. All right, pretty easy to compute also. Again, I designed most of these problems so we don't need a calculator. We can do these relatively easily by hand. What's the next number in the pattern? 0.01. There we go. So it goes one tenth, hundredth, we'll go thousandth next. 32 plus 16 times 0.01. 32 plus 0.16. 32.16. So 0.001, 32 plus 16 times 0.001 is 32 plus 0 0.016. 32.016. All right, fill in the next line here. Next one is point zero 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 one. So one ten thousandth. And tell me what your average velocity should be. The pattern should be painfully obvious right now. So at this point, your brain should be telling you, I got it. I can do the next 10, no problem. What is the pattern if I did a crazy number of zeros, as many as I can fit before I run out of space, you could tell me exactly what the average velocity would be. What number is it getting close to? 32. 32. So at this point, you should feel comfortable saying it's going to get very close to 32. Starting point 32? Uh, not the starting point, but if we, so if we continue this pattern, if I just write dot, 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 continue pattern, dot, 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 we would be going towards h equals zero. That's where these decimals are going. They're getting smaller and smaller. So where is our average velocity getting closer to, we wrote it down, it's getting closer to 32. So it turns out our instantaneous velocity, velocity is 32. Uh, we'll hit it with a limit as h approaches zero, the difference quotient, and not build a huge table of values. This is a slow way to do it. <clears throat> All right, so we got the instantaneous velocity by basically looking at a progression of numbers. And we said, uh, we're smart enough to tell you what happens if I kept going forever. We don't have forever to keep going, but we can use our imagination. It's not very hard to say it's going to go to 32. Now I picked one that had a really nice easy pattern. So it didn't converge to like pi plus square root two. That might be harder to see. So this one converged to 32. So it's pretty easy to see. So let's look back to average velocity is 32 plus 16h. What do you get if you just set h equals zero? 32. So there we go. If you look here, just set h equal to zero. All right, we have a slate. So that absolutely works in this form. No problem. We got average velocity 32. But if we go right up to this form, what happens if h is zero here? 
you get under, you get zero divided by zero. So without canceling some algebra, I can't say what this is right away. Algebra is not hard. Factor, cancel, and you're all set. So on this one, I cannot just set h to zero. So what we're going to be doing is reducing difference quotients, simplifying difference quotients to eliminate the h in the denominator. That's the algebra we're going to be doing in the next week. So we have our difference quotient. And we're going to simplify. Now, simplify is, I don't like that word very much in math because it's ambiguous. So I'm going to say simplify and very specifically simplify to eliminate the h in the denominator. So you keep simplifying until there's no more h in the denominator. Until the denominators h, the denominators h uh, is canceled. There's going to be three tricks to do this, and let's see, one of them is FOIL, combined like terms, which we just did. That's, one, that's the easy one. And then there's going to be multiply by conjugate over conjugate. And then another one is going to be something else. Oh, combining fractions with common denominators. So those are the three main types I'll give you. Um, we'll do a really fun one with sine and cosine. That'll use the sum difference formula for sine and cosine, and then factoring and canceling. But we, I won't give that to you on a quiz. All right, so that's the difference quotient. We will be using this a whole lot in chapter two, and a little bit in chapter three. All right, so you took trig last quarter, whenever last quarter was. You saw the word secant. Now secant means something completely different. So you can forget about the old secant until we need to use it again. But it won't be for a little while. So a secant line. So this word, unfortunately, is repeated. But this is a new definition of secant line. So a secant line is a secant line of a graph at two points. At, let's see, two points, let's call it uh, x1, f of x1, and x2, f of x2. So we need two points. Is the line passing through these two points? So visually, what does this look like? If you have just some curve right here, got x1, x2, one point there, one other point here, you have some y-axis, y1, y2. It is very easy to draw the secant line. Oh, I can draw a perfectly straight line. Could have done better. All right, secant line right there. If I give you two points that are not the same point, two different points, how many lines can you draw between them? One. You can draw the same line many times, but you really only can draw one line between two points if they're not the same. So there's only one secant line uh, given two points. All right, so there's a secant line right there. We called this distance right here h. And x2 
you could think of it as x1 plus h for other notation. <clears throat> let's look at, on this curve right here that I drew, let's look at the slope right at the x1 point. I'll make it super bold so we know we're talking about the same point. So the curve, that's the one that's curved, not the one that's straight. So the curve is y equals f of x. So for this curve, would you say the slope is positive or negative at x1? Does it look like it's going upwards or downwards when you go to the right? Downwards. A little bit negative. It's pretty close to flat, but definitely negative. What's the curve of the secant line we just drew? Positive. Positive. So certainly they're not exactly the same slope right there. So the curve has a negative slope, the line has a positive slope. What happens if I make a new secant line and I say, okay, let's use these two points right here that I just made in blue and connect them together. Ah, come on. I'm trying to draw the straightest line I can. What? All right, you get the point though. Pretty close to, oh, it's time? All right, so our, if we get the points close together, the secant slope is really close to the slope of the actual curve. And the closer I move the two points, the better it is.